Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. How are you today? I hope all of you are do doing well and ready to be uh, informed yeah, for this event today. We'll have the title Bioinformatics Analysis for Microbiome Studies. Yeah. So as uh, maybe you already know that the speaker today is Ms. Farania Rangkuti, yeah, which is one of the founding member in Nusantix, yeah, and uh, she is also uh, the head of bioinformatics, yeah, and uh, for the for the code of conducts today. Okay, so uh, let me share for one. So these are the code of conducts. The participants uh, will be asked to fill, uh, kindly fill in the Google form, shared in the chat link to record your attendance. Yeah, and then the participants will receive e certificates at the end of the event. And then participants must mute the audio during the Power Talk session. And then participants are allowed to use the chat feature to ask questions to the speaker. Yeah. And then finally, the evaluation survey will be shared to the Power Talk attendees at the end of the event. Yeah. So please uh, participate to fill in the evaluation survey. And then for today's speaker. Yeah, we will hear from uh, our speaker. Uh, okay, so uh, I remind the attendees for uh, turn off your audio. Yeah, please. Uh, during the event, you are required to turn off the audio. Yeah, please mute your audio and then. Make sure that uh, the speaker can be uh, heard, yeah, can be heard without any distraction. And then now uh, for the speaker today is Miss Farania Rangkuti. I will tell a bit of her, yeah, about her CV. So her education background, for the doctoral degree, she is uh, a student in University of Oxford. Yeah, so she, uh, she has the concentration in bioinformatics at University of Oxford, UK. And then uh, she did her master degree in uh, Kaus, Saudi Arabia, and for the, her bachelor degree, she uh, graduated from University of Indonesia. Okay, by the way, she is my senior in uh, University of Indonesia. Yeah, and then also she completed her bachelor in QT Australia as a. Uh, research student yeah and then for the research skills she uh, has some highlights here skills in bioinformatics and data analytics genomics computational biology sequencing as well as programming for the awards and grants she is one of the recipient of Slumbergy Faculty of the Future Award, and then Global Collaboration Research Student Award, also Kaus Fellowship, yeah, for her master degree. Okay, let us welcome our speaker for today, Miss Farania Rangkuti. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farania. Yeah, you may start. Okay, should I share my screen? Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Let me. Right. I'm gonna play. Yes. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. 
uh, it's an honor for me. Thank you for having me. Uh, and also just a, a little bit of correction, if I may. So um, right now, my position is a founding member and advisor in the Suntex. And also um, at Oxford, um, I do also uh, some computational modeling, but uh, because the research there is quite multidisciplinary, so um, um, it's, I don't know if it can be called uh, bioinformatics, but yeah, um, th there's some bioinformatics component to it, but I also did a lot of lab work there. Yeah, that's all. Okay, so thank you again. And this is what I'm going to present to you today. Okay, I'm just gonna minimize Zoom. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about bioinformatics analysis for microbiome studies. But uh, before that, can I know uh, from you students, uh, how many of you are familiar with bioinformatics? Can you uh, type in the chat? So um, I can kind of adjust my presentation based on your familiarity. Can you type in the chat? I'm waiting for you. Okay. This is Kakar Tavia doing masters. Wow. Amazing. Okay. Vishnu. Who else? Should I assume that the rest of you are not familiar with it yet? Okay, so I have three so far. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, one more. Not familiar. Okay, so uh, one familiar. Okay. What about microbiome? How many of you are familiar with microbiome? Quite familiar with the tech terminology, but not the techniques. Okay, thank you, Kamalia. Who else? <laughs> microbiome, yes. Okay, that's really great. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Come on, we have uh, 69 people here. Microbiome, okay, thank you, Kazahira, who else? Just starting to learn. Okay, I think Ms. Pulspa also mentioned that um, a lot of you are probably uh, just starting, right? Uh, this 2022. So I will keep that in mind. So maybe I'll, I'll try to give, uh, you know, some kind of introductory, um, explanation first, so uh, it's uh, easier for you to follow. Okay, thank you, thank you, Karif. Yeah. Uh, let me start by introducing Nusantix. Uh, maybe you've heard of Nusantix. So Nusantix is a genomics application company uh, founded in 2019. Uh, so about three years ago, with the ever-growing belief in the importance of microbes and microbiome balance in life. Uh, but um, before we continue, I want to explain what is a microbiome, because why, uh, why is it so important that somebody actually founded a company <laughs> uh, for this? So a microbiome is the community of microorganisms living together in a particular habitat. Why is it important to um, stress this, that it's uh, living together? Why? Because uh, what this microbiome produces, it's not, um, uh, it cannot be separated from the interaction between the members, uh, what's happening in this community. So it's not just the microorganism, but um, as one researcher said, it's the theater of activities that is inside this uh, habitat. There are a lot of members from different species and um, they interact with each other. They produce some, you know, like byproducts or metabolites or 
anything else. And this affects the outcome of the whole community, right? Um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Maybe you have heard of this saying. This is from uh, an ancient Greek saying from Aristoteles. Or maybe you've heard of this um, idiom in Bahasa, bersatu kita teguh, bercerai kita runtuh. So it cannot be separated from the interaction within the community. And why microbiome? Uh, because our planet is a microbiome universe. Actually, there are more microbiome species on Earth than stars in the galaxy. I'm sure you know this already because you are studying in ITL, right? Uh, but maybe you don't know that your digestive, digestive tract alone is actually home to more than 10 trillion bacteria, more than all the stars in the Milky Way in our galaxy. That's quite uh, amazing if you think about it, right? There is so many uh, microorganisms around us. And why? Okay, so um, I hope you have uh, learned that um, it's very important to appreciate this fact, to understand that we live in a world surrounded by micro microbes, uh, microbiomes. Why? Uh, for example, you know, um, we are still in the pandemic in COVID. Uh, COVID is also uh, one of the microorganisms, um, but not just that, but we actually rely so much on these microbes, right? And our story as humans on this planet began with them. If we are not careful, we might also end with them. This is also another example why microbes are important. Microbes are the beginning of the food web that feeds all our higher life forms and also the support system of the biosphere. This is, a, I quote this from Professor Brick, Kafiokioli. And uh, do you know that marine microbiomes also supply most of the oxygen that we breathe? If you weigh all the living organism in the ocean, 90% of that weight would be from microbes, not from the whale or from the sharks, but they're actually from microbes. And uh, in our body, I mean, you don't have to look that far. Everything, uh, almost everything in our body is covered with microbes. You have microbes in your gut, you have microbes on your skin, you have, you have microbes in a lot of parts of your body. Uh, microbes in the human body, the microbiome um, in the human body help digest our food, regulate our immune system, protect against pathogens that can cause disease, and also produce vitamins. Um, this is just an example from some of the papers about uh, microbes and microbiome. So I hope uh, you can read more about this to learn more about microbiome and the importance of it. Yeah, so simply put, uh, microbes are our superheroes uh, if we take care of them. Yeah, so that's also uh, needs to be stressed. Okay, now um, I want to take us to um, look at our human body from different perspectives. The first one, uh, let's see it from the cell's perspective. Right, um, you know that we have about 30 trillion human cells in our body, but did you know that we actually have 39 trillion microbial cells? And um, in percentage, that's 43% of actual human cells and 57% of microbial cells. So we have more microbial cells in our body than our own cells. Um, if you look at it from the genes perspective, okay, we have uh, 20,000 human genes oh, and yeah, yeah, between yeah. 2 to 20 million mm -hmm. microbial genes. So again, in percentage, that's about 1% of the human genes and about 99% of the genes that uh, we have in our body is actually from these microbes. Okay, now um, 
uh, this microbiome is actually the genes that we can change, you know, because uh, human genetics, more or less, it's a fix. You know, you're born with a, your DNA and um, it's uh, pretty much fixed. And the difference with microbiome is that you can actually change it. You can uh, change that by um, decide like what to eat, what to drink, the environment you're in, the level of pollution in your environment, uh, how much physical exercise you have, your stress level, or what kind of drugs you consume. Okay. And this is an example of uh, one of our services that we provide in Asantix for biome scan. So you can come to our hub in Senapati area. Uh, you can get swab, but uh, not the throat swab like COVID swab, but this is uh, just a gentle swipe on your cheek, on your forehead, and we're going to analyze uh, your microbiome for you. You can try it. Okay, oops. And this is also like a little bit about Mosantix. We were founded in 2019 and we, start, uh, we started launching a lot of products uh, in March 2020. That's when we took initiative with uh, BPPT and BioPharma. And on the right side, you will see uh, some examples of products that we have. Uh, you're welcome to come to our hub in Senapati again to ask more about this, or you can send me a message on LinkedIn. I will happily tell you more about it. Okay. And in this presentation, mostly I'm going to uh, talk about the bioinformatics analysis for microbiome studies. Okay, so this is just a timeline uh, from the lab to bioinformatics. So in the early uh, what is it, 17th century, we humans, we first observed microscopic organism in the microscope, right? And from there, just like about 100 year, 200 years later, we finally found, you know, like a clear ideas, like we, we had clear ideas and we found the connection between micro, microorganism and disease because for uh, some time, you know, like people even uh, thought that uh, some of diseases were caused by, I don't know, for example, bad air or uh, some things that uh, you did previously, you know. Um, but finally, we found that connection and we understood, and that enabled us to develop a lot of methods like culture, staining, microscopy in the late uh, 19th century. And also, after that, we, uh, we had a DNA sequencing technology, as I'm sure all of you know. We uh, managed to do the sequencing of our DNA from the 1980s and present. Uh, but um, initially, we were, of course, focused on just sequencing our own DNA, right? Um, uh, our human DNA. In 2007, uh, that was when the Human Microbiome Project was launched by NIH in the US. Uh, this was like the landmark study that um, enabled uh, the microbiome studies to flourish in the world. Um, from then, we had uh, a lot of progress in the microbiome field, but of course, because the field is quite young relatively. Um, it's still um, under a lot of, you know, there's a lot of changes. And in 2010 and now we are starting to use a lot of bioinformatics and multi-omics uh, methods. Uh, it doesn't mean that before this we didn't have bioinformatics. I mean, of course we did, but it's just like getting more and more widespread. Okay. And what was the rationale for human microbiome project? So this is a presentation. I took this from a presentation from one of the key figures in uh, NIH. Um, so initially they observed that um, 
we as humans we have developed um, a lot of uh, drugs you know like antibiotics um, that uh, could help us with infectious diseases right like as you can see here from 1950 to 2000 the incidence of infectious diseases has dropped okay for many of these right uh, this is an example of measles mumps is a tuberculosis, rheumatic fever. Um, also, we also develop vaccines, right? That, that help with uh, some of these infectious diseases. Uh, however, if you look at the incidence of immune disorders or autoimmune diseases, it has actually gone up instead of down, right? So uh, the researchers, they were starting to wonder like what uh what causes this like maybe there's some sort of connection between these two right and this is why they wanted to learn more about the microbes about the microbiome the interaction between the microbes the habitat and so on that's why they started this project uh, it's it was and is a large project it's um it was, I think, around 215 million USD. By now, it's, um, I heard it's more than a billion, 1 billion USD now, this project. Um, yeah, so with the next generation sequencing technology, we are now able to do microbiome analysis um, in large scale, and that's what they did. Okay. Um, why is culturing not enough? You know, like um, I mentioned about culturing a little bit earlier. So we could culture the microbes and we can analyze them. But um, unfortunately, more organisms actually, they cannot grow in pure culture. And culturing also cannot capture the full spectrum of the diversity that we have because it's very, very diverse. I mean, depending on the environment, of course, but generally there are so many a microorganism to see if they are like, for example, just let's pick a number of just like 1000 in, uh, in the soil, for example. And if you try to culture it one by one, it's, it's very time consuming, right? And also maybe most of them also won't grow. Okay. Um, now that we have sequencing, we can do profiling we can try to understand these communities by sequencing. And usually there are two main technical approaches. The first one um, is uh, what is called amplicon sequencing. So you, let's say um, uh, these um, are, I hope you can see my cursor. So uh, these are different microbes like the red rectangle, for example, let's say it's, I don't know, a virus, and the green one is a, a bacteria, and the blue one is fungi, the brown one is uh, an archaea, for example, and you want to first extract the DNA, right, and you have these uh, circles, of different colors that um, represent the DNA, like each of them. Um, and we have like two main methods to do this. Like the first one, we have amplicon sequencing. So what uh, you do is you, mul you multiply the, um, sorry, you have uh, multiple copies of the fragments from one target genes or a few target genes. So normally you would choose a target gene that are shared by the organisms that you want to study. Like for example, in bacteria, it's usually 16S ribosomal RNA, because this is usually, this gene is usually shared around, this region is usually shared around uh, bacteria. In fungi, it's probably ITS region, because also that's shared by uh, a lot of fungi if not all. So yeah, that's uh, what's called amplicon sequencing. Uh, the metagenomic sequencing is quite different because 
what you do, instead of just focusing on, on one or a few target genes, you actually sequence all of them. So all of the genomes. So you just um, do um, take the fragments. Uh, usually it's, it would be short sequence fragments uh, from all of the DNA and you try to assemble it and then you try to classify it and you try to analyze it, but you take all of them, right? And this is why we have the term metagenome. Now, we need to talk about this term because um, I've read a really heated debate between two professors, two respected researchers in this field, um, arguing about the term. Because like, initially, as you said, or as you saw earlier, right, this uh, metagenome, uh, they, um, it is usually a genome that has all the genomes that are present in that environment. So it's like a combined genome of all the individual microorganisms that are present in that environmental sample, right? But um, these days, some people would also uh, call the other uh, method, this one, applicant sequencing, metagenome even though um, technically they don't take all the genomes, right? They just take the copies of uh, one or a few target genes from these genomes. But uh, sometimes people also call this kind of study also a metagenomic study. So I just want you to understand that um, there is this um, term that uh, some people might still be debating, but it can refer to both. Sometimes people use this term to uh, describe both, right? Um, and this is just a general overview of the workflow um, of the first one. I'm sorry, can you see this? Yeah, this is the first one, the amplicon sequencing workflow. So, um, um, yeah, but uh, normally when you work in a company or when you work in a research project, even in academia, you're not supposed to just like follow blindly any workflow that somebody else published. Like, for example, I took this from Astrobio Mike uh, in GitHub uh, because, um, yeah, it's uh, what uh, exactly what we do in our company is confidential. So I'm just uh, taking an example. Um, why? Because um, your data and someone else's data might be very, very different, right? Um, they might be analyzing soil, you might be analyzing the gut, for example, or the skin or the lung microbiome. And um, there can be a lot of very vital differences in between these two kinds of data, even between uh, the same kinds of data, let's say skin, you know, like uh, skin from uh, Indonesian population, let's say, and skin from Caucasian population, the data might be quite different, you know, that you cannot just use any of these uh, workshops blindly, um, even when the, the, the population is the same. Uh, you might use, you know, like slightly different technology to sequence them. You might use slightly different primers. You might have a different uh, sequencing coverage, for example. So it's very important to understand what you need and then um, test the workflow, uh, develop, uh, your unique workflow that would fit your data. And sometimes you might also need, you know, custom modification or you need to develop like other custom libraries to uh, analyze your data. That's really normal. And if you're interested in working in bioinformatics or you are, um, I hope you understand that um, that's the kind of effort that you know, that we, we have to put in, in this field to, to really do the best in analyzing the data. Um, so just briefly, so yeah, this is the workflow uh, when you get your data from a sequencing facility where they do DNA sequencing, or you can also do it on your own, in your own lab, um, that's possible. 
Okay, but the point is you will get uh, FASTQ files. Uh, I will give you an example of that. I will show you an example of the FASTQ format later. And these FASTQ files, you need to uh, split them first. You need to split the samples by barcodes. Sorry, this should be barcodes. Why? Because initially they are still, mm, you know, sometimes they're still mixed up, right? And because um, it's usually, uh, usually you would sequence a lot of samples at once. You wouldn't just sequence one sample, especially if it's, if the genomes are small, like uh, bacterial genomes or fungal genomes, you would usually do a lot in one go. So you would get a lot of uh, these um, sequences that are still mixed. And then you need to demultiplex it you need to split it and then you need to do quality filtering or you will need to trim which is to cut a little bit either like you know in the beginning or at the end of the sequence to remove the adapters or primers that are probably still attached to the sequence um, uh, because uh, sometimes you would get you know like low quality sequences or um, just uh, just random bits that you don't need that will actually um, make your further analysis, um, you know, more complicated or not just complicated, but sometimes it will change your data in a certain way. That's not good. So you will need to do this quality filtering or trimming first. You will, after that, you will take the FASTA files that are produced from this, and you do the replication. Many of these are, uh, you know, um, sequences. And then you do camera removal. So with the PCR uh, method, sometimes there is a mistake in the procedure, right? Uh, that's just uh, inherent nature of, of PCR. Sometimes it will accidentally from one mechanism in you, like the, 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 the process of uh, amplification will continue, but like the next part will be taken from a different organism. So that will create like chimeric sequences that you need to remove. And there are ways to remove that. And after that, you will generate uh, either OTUs or ASV. These two are just the term that we use um, in this study. So OTUs is like the uh, operational taxonomic unit. It's just the basic term, uh, the basic unit, taxonomic unit that you use in your study. Uh, it can be a species, it can be a genus, it can be a strain even, it, it really depends on your study, but that's the unit that you will look at and say, okay, um, um, you will analyze and you will try to make sense of this, but that's, that's just, uh, the unit, you know, like, um, I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, maybe uh, let's take an analogy of um, a bakery. You go to a bakery. I know why I'm talking about bakery because I baked some um, bread yesterday. So this is an analogy. You go to a bakery and when you go there, you want to buy some stuff, right? Uh, what's the unit? that you use to buy something. You can uh, decide that one unit is one piece of bread or one unit is one plastic bag of bread or one unit is one uh, basket of bread, right? It, it really, uh, it's up to you. It depends on your study, what you need. So if you are buying for an event, maybe one unit is one basket, but if you're just buying, food for eating like on your own, then maybe one unit is just one small piece of bread, right? So that's the analogy. Okay, ASV is also similar to OTU, uh, but it's a little bit different. Um, so when people um, came up with the concept of this operational taxonomic unit a while back, they actually, um, um, took the reference from some studies at that time that actually look at, okay, um, 
they they knew that when you have like two different species that are closely related, you know, like they actually share a lot of DNA, right? So um, from this basic concept, you can actually put sequences that are similar to each other uh, in one, um, uh, you can say a basket or like one uh, entity and you call that OTU. So it's kind of like a representative sequence from, um, from uh, you can say, let's say from a species, but with ASV, it's not really, um, you know, you don't, you don't put together a lot of different uh, species or different strains in one, one entity, but you actually try to get a very, very high resolution of uh, these sequences. You try to resolve the errors and um, you try to clean the errors also. There are a lot of tools to do that. Um, and then after you have resolved the errors, you have like one clean sequence that uh, you call ASV, but, uh, they, uh, but you can have uh, different ASVs from the same unit. For example, you have a different, uh, you have, uh, let's say there is uh, one species, you have Cutibacterium ST, for example. And from that uh, species, you can have, uh, from the group of species or a species, it's up to you. You can have a lot of different ASV because one ASV represents a sequence, right? But um, they, because a species usually can have a different variation in it. Um, so you can have multiple ASVs from the same species or from the same group of species or, or anything you want. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a bit abstract right now, uh, but um, uh, it uh, maybe at this point, it's not really important. I just want to give you a general overview of um, what needs to be done in this kind of studies, um, right? So after that, you will have uh, different kinds of output. You will have the count table that as you can see here, it just describes you know, the sequence and the sample uh, and uh, what are the counts of um, ASVs or OTUs that you see in that sample, right? Um, like. Uh, for example, sequence one, like we, we just uh, uh, put uh, this as sequence, sequence one, sequence two, sequence three, but they can actually represent, you know, ASV or OTU. So sequence one can be ASV1, for example. And then you want to see like how many of ASV1 or sequence one you can uh, find in your data in sample A how many of sequence one you can find in sample B and so on. Like, uh, you just do this for all of your samples and all of your sequences until you have one big table. It's usually quite big, <laughs> um, yeah. But after you have this, you can do also further analysis. There's a lot of analysis that you can do. You have uh, alpha diversity analysis, which I'm also going to talk about a little bit. There is also taxonomic summaries where you just summarize, okay, what I see in my data, what are the species or what are the strains or what are the genesis in this um, um, and what are their percentages in the data, right? You can also do beta diversity analysis. Analysis. I'm also going to talk about this uh, later in this presentation. Uh, there's a lot you can do. You can also do uh, machine learning uh, for this. Uh, of course, it, it really depends on uh, what you need to look at, what you need to study, but there's a lot of things you can do. Okay, and this is also an example of the uh, metagenomic workflow. You know the second the second technical approach that I mentioned to you. Again, uh, with this workflow, you cannot follow any 
anyone else or for blindly, you need to test it. You need to find the best uh, tools, the best parameters even for your data uh, because they will be different. Okay, and uh, if you see here, like the first part from the sequencing facility to FASTA slash FASTQ files, they're more or less the same, right? Uh, the concepts are more or less the same. But after that, remember, because in this workflow, in this type of uh, approach, you actually get uh, short uh, fragments of all of the genomes that are there in your sample, right? So uh, in this, like you would, um, you would have two options uh, after this point. You have the option to do assembly, if you choose the option of as uh, genomes, you know, it's like, you know, you, I'm sure you have uh, tried solving puzzles, right? You have like a lot of different pieces and you want to put them together to get like one big final thing. <laughs> you can uh, frame together, right? Um, it's good that you have a reference to uh, guide you uh, when doing your puzzles. Like for example, when doing your puzzles, pr probably in the box, when you bought the puzzle, they will show you how should it look like, right? The final picture of how the final puzzle should look like. So you can just follow that. But uh, oftentimes, especially if you're dealing with a new um, organism that hasn't been uh, studied before, you don't have that. You don't have the guide. You need to assemble them on your own, right? And this is like one of the challenges because you need to work with the unknowns. Um, so here we have some of the tools. So that was uh, an example of the challenge in working with assembly. This is, uh, I have like a list of some tools here that you can use to do assembly. You can also use MetaQuest to compare assembly. Um, but if you don't want to do the assembly part, you can also just do read-based analysis. Like for example, with Kraken here, you can uh, classify your sample, your reads, and then it will show you like this read goes to what uh, taxonomically like it belongs to what taxonomy groups and so on. Um, you can also do digital normalization like BB norm, for example, if you have like a, um, some uneven coverage in your uh, data. So BB norm, it can reduce the coverage that is uh, uh, coverage in some parts that are um, unnaturally high. I mean, we don't expect that to be high, but because of you know um, the some error or uh, some problems in the sequence generation process, maybe in the sequencing, sometimes you will get that problem. It will try to normalize it, and this also will help you um, uh, in doing assembly. Why it will make your data uh, cleaner or like more manageable, more tractable. And after that, uh, you have a lot of options. You can do uh, phylogenomics, you can do gene calling, you can do taxonomic profiling, you can do like, for example, this one, PROCA. I also use PROCA in the past for different project. Um, you would do, you know, like annotation of that genes uh, to see um, what are the functions, you know, like sometimes um, you can, uh, usually you can predict the functions of certain genes, even when they are novel, you know, uh, based on the other annotated genes that we have in the database, okay? You can also do comparative genomics. You can uh, generate some really nice graphs to see the composition of your data. Like for example, here, uh, there's a lot of things you can do, okay? Okay, um, other than those approaches, 
you can also do other things. Um, you can do functional metagenomics. I will explain a little bit after this. You can also do metaproteomics, so similar to what I described, but this is uh, mostly you, you are going to focus on the proteins instead of the genes. You can also do transcriptomics. You look at the transcripts, metabolomics. You can look at the small molecules. You can also do culturomics. That's like, uh, quite new. So you do like large scale culture. culture. Um, yeah. Can you please uh, turn off? Uh, Diano Putra, can you please turn off? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and you can do also functional metagenomics uh, like this. So you uh, generate DNA fragments, you do uh, restriction enzyme digestion or other things, and then you ligate that to a factor. So your factor will have these DNA fragments of interest uh, that you want to study, right? And then you have a lot of these and when you have like a lot you can call it like a library a library of uh, recombinant factors and for in this field you can use the library that you already have to search for specific enzymatic activities or proteins um, you can screen it uh, you can knock out certain genes uh, to see like what kind of genes are um, useful for a certain um, things. I mean, sorry, it's not useful, but like absolutely um, necessary for a certain function, right? For, for example, here, UV radiation resistance, like you need to find out like what are the genes. So this is an example of the application. Okay, now um, we have a core concept here in microbiome studies. And uh, this is very important because if you look at a lot of microbiome papers, you would see them um, discussing this, you know, either alpha diversity or beta diversity, usually. Okay, so what is alpha diversity? So alpha diversity um, is a measure of diversity of a community. Okay, this is a photo, not really a photo, an illustration of, you know, like trees in certain area. Right. Why do we use a lot of trees uh, usually to talk about this? Because initially, um, this field borrowed a lot from uh, ecology, traditional ecology, the microecology, where you look at trees, you look at animals, you look at things you can see. So they initially developed this first, the, the people from ecology. So you would uh, find a community and then you try to to uh, measure the diversity by like certain metrics, right? I'm gonna give you some example of the metrics later. And then if you talk about beta diversity, it's diversity between communities. So you have example here, community A, and you have community B, and you want to measure the, the diversity between them. So that's beta diversity. I hope this is clear. Okay, and uh, but you need to keep this in mind while when you uh, study microbiome, when you talk about one community, we usually mean one sample. Why? Because that sample already has a lot of microbes um, inside it um, that has a specific habitat that also has a specific interaction between them. So it's a microbiome really. So one swab sample, for example, from your cheek um, has a lot of these. So there is a community of these microbes living on your skin, right? So just keep that in mind. So don't get confused with, oh, one sample. So what is one community? Yeah, this is um, just uh, to make it clear, okay? And we have two main factors here in measuring alpha diversity there is this thing called richness and there is this another concept called evenness. So for example, here, um, I'll give you some example. So this uh, community of fruits here, uh, it has low richness, okay? Uh, compared to the other two on the right side. Why? Because this one only has three types of fruit and the other one uh, on the right, the other two, 
has uh, two types, right? So this one has lower richness than the other one, right? But what about the evenness? Evenness is something else. Um, you can have low richness, but still have high evenness. Because in evenness, you actually look at um, the distribution, right? The distributions of the types of fruits of, or, of member or members. Like for example, here, uh, the first one on the left side, you have three types of fruits, but you have four apples. So there are four apples out of six, right? Uh, it's not really even, right? The apples dominate. And in the second one, you have high evenness because uh, each of the fruit, each of the fruit type, they are present in a similar proportion, the same proportion. So there are two oranges, two pears, two apples. And it's the same thing with the, the, with the right, with the last two communities, right? You have a high richness, but uh, within this same richness, you can still have low evenness and high evenness. I hope this is clear. Uh, because I'm going to show you in the next slide, uh, just a small quiz, okay? I want you to see this one, okay? Uh, please write down in your chat box, okay? Um, community two. Um, is community two, does community two have lower or higher richness? And does it have um, lower or higher evenness? Can you please put it in your chat box? This is a small quiz. I'm going to write it um, uh, in the chat box. Okay, this is my question. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, come on. Prove it to me that you're not sleeping. <laughs> okay, interesting. Okay, let me check. Hmm. Okay, anyone else wants to add? Low reaches, low evenness, okay. Hmm. Okay, I can see that some of you answered correctly, but some of you did not answer correctly. Um, Okay. Oops. I want to scroll at the chat. Okay, anyone else? Okay, hey, maybe I'll choose uh, one of you to talk. Um, higher, just a lower even. Hmm. Low richness, low evenness, okay. Okay, hmm, interesting. Okay, who else? Come on, everyone else, are you sleeping? 
Okay, I'm gonna you I'm gonna choose um um Kak Sahid Bismantoko. Are you a student or are you a lecturer? Should I say Pak Sahid, Kak Sahid? Yeah, because yes, Miss. Yes, um Kak Sahid. Are you a student or are you a lecturer? I'm a researcher right now in uh, national uh, yes. brain. Oh and, wow, Pasahid. Okay, that's why you got it right. <laughs> you have like a lot of uh, experience. <laughs> no, 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 I'm already uh, start learning uh, about bioinformatics. Wow. Okay, can you uh, please explain to us uh, why you think both have the same richness and but okay. why is the community one has high or evenness? Uh, as you present uh, previously, yeah, uh, that, that the both community have a uh, equal equal richness. Uh, they 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 have uh, they have a uh, four variant plant yes. variant here. They have four, yes. And the community community one have a higher richness than community two community two okay am i right uh yes can you explain more about uh why community one has higher um evenness uh, the same population uh, in each uh, class in its variant plan. Same proportion, maybe. Yes. No. Yes. Yes, that's true. That's true. Thank you so much, Pa Sahid. You are welcome. Thank you so much for your explanation. Okay. Yeah, uh, Pa Sahid is absolutely right. Um, so uh, you can see here in community one and community two, we have the same species richness. Why? Because they are the same types of trees. Like they are exactly the same numbers of three types, right? You have three, one, three, two, three, three, and three, four, like four types. You, you will find these four types in both communities, right? So in terms of species richness, they are equally rich, right? Same richness. However, if you count like the number of trees or you just look at it at a glance, you will see that in community two, you see this tree, I don't know what type of tree this is in real life because I'm not like a botanist or something, but um, you can see that this tree kind of dominates, right? It dominates the population, the community. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven. Well, um, like for example, the uh, the trees that looks like the Christmas tree, uh, it looks like there are only two. Okay, so eleven versus two, and then versus you know this tree that looks like bringing. Not sure. Uh, there is only one even in this community, and like there is also two of the other type, like the fourth type, this one the one that a bit looks like christmas tree but has a very light color so community one uh, has a um, higher evenness like in fact um i believe this is they have uh, equal proportion so that's like the most even it can be right let's say you have a pizza and you have four people four hungry people wanting to eat the pizza and you divide them equally like uh, one pizza divided by four so each of you get like a quarter of the pizza this is like the most even um distribution of the pizza right so when you have that it means like the evenness is the highest right while here it's not uh, really even because there is one tree that dominates and there are other trees that are you know like um underrepresented just like the previous slide um, here. You see, um, here you can see 
um, if the evenness is high, you have like similar proportion or similar abundance. And in this example, com community one actually has higher evenness because it has more similar uh, proportion or distribution. Okay, thank you so much for everyone who participated. Okay, no worries, Eka, like all good. Um, and yeah, thank you. Okay, um, and now we have a example of the matrix here. I'll give you some example. Uh, there are actually so many metrics that are available to measure diversity, like um, alpha diversity, in alpha diversity, you have dozens, if not hundreds, I don't know. Um, um, there is a Chow index, Chow one index, fate phylogenetic diversity, Shannon index, and a lot of things. You can even make up your new um, metric or index. Why? Why do we need so many? Because um, people have different purposes in their study, right? So the way they want to measure things, like sometimes like for um, one study, you know, it's more important to look at the richness than the evenness. Therefore, they will create a metric that um, gives like bigger weight to the richness, but lower weight to the evenness or the other way around or so on, you see, or you want a matrix that can also capture the phylogenetic data behind you know, um, this uh, variation. That's why you have fate phylogenetic diversity, for example, that look at uh, the position of uh, taxa or taxon um, in the phylogenetic tree. And you want to use that information to give you a measure of diversity, right? That's why we have so many. So you have a beta also, also beta diversity. I'm gonna give you an example also of a beta diversity. And you have a lot here. You have Comparatis and Jacquard, Bay Curtis, and so many more, okay? And these are different again, like for example, in Jacquard, you only look at um, the presence of absence of one thing, let's say a species. Uh, you want to, ch you just check, okay, is this species present or not present? in the community. While with breaker, this you want to also take into account the abundance information. So it's really different. Or in Unifrac, for example, you uh, will also look at the um, phylogeny and a lot of things, for example. Okay, many more. Okay, and this is an example of breaker. This um and this is uh the formula um, again it was borrowed from ecology uh the original paper was published a long time ago in the uh, 50s and oh uh, yeah they look at uh, forest communities in the us um so this is where the forest or the three references come from right because it comes from ecology so i have these uh, formula is a mathematical formula and also have a, a, another quiz actually but I don't think I have time for that so it's okay you can just screenshot it and you can do it on your own at home and uh, if you feel like it you can send me the answer to my LinkedIn and I will tell you what's the correct answer or not so just feel free to just sc screenshot this and do it on your own and you can also screenshot the previous one the previous formula and you can try to figure it out Okay, now, um, yeah, we can uh, look at some examples here of the formats of the files that uh, we have to work with uh, in these types of studies, right? The FASTQ, for example, like I just mentioned to you, this is like an example of, let's say, um, um, a file that comes from an uh, Illumina machine, for example. Illumina is one of the more widely used uh, sequencing technologies. Uh, so uh, this is an example of that. You can see this is the format. This is the raw sequence. You have like the, uh, the four uh, bases here, the DNA bases, C, C, T, A, T, G, right? You can see this. And like underneath that, you have like um, also 
a string of characters, okay? But uh, those strings of characters under the plus sign, they are not um, the basis, but they actually represent a score of each of the bases up there, right? So this is a SCII uh, coding representation um, of the score. Okay? And here we don't need to um, discuss that a lot. Also, I don't have time, uh, but you can just look at this and see and appreciate that um, you will need to deal with a lot of numbers in this field. So, um, yeah, if you like to work with numbers, uh, you will enjoy this type of work. Okay. Uh, this is also the SV table or the count table that I already mentioned to you earlier. And also there's like the data diversity values. So after you do calculation for um, of the these. Okay. And is that we actually have a lot of um, data and the data has a large dimension, right? Uh, for example, uh, this is just um, as ASV table. I have to censor this bit. <laughs> lot of complicated data. Um, when you show the same data, when you show it in a plot, uh, this one is called PCOA plot, principal component analysis. Um, it's so much easier to see, right? Uh, you'll have like uh, several dots and you have here, you have three axes. So you can um, understand the data uh, in um, a bit. Uh, so this is why uh, visualization is uh, really important uh, in microbiome studies. And we have uh, this concept called ordination, where you try to reduce the data that are very, very high in dimension, uh, in hundreds of dimensions, or like even a thousand dimension and so on, to, you know, the three dimension like this, you have like three axes and you can uh, usually even like um, these, like there are some tools that will allow you to um, rotate them uh, in real time. So you can see the data from, from different perspective, from up, from down, you can turn it, uh, move it left, move it right. Um, and you can even change the axis. Uh, normally you would look at the one, two or three axis, but um, maybe something, you will find something interesting in the fourth axis or the fifth axis and you can change the axis, right? Uh, but the point is uh, you need uh, uh, ordination to be able to reduce the data that you have um, into like more manageable dimension because we humans, we live in three dimension, right? If you watch cartoon, that's two dimension, but human, we live in like three dimensional world. So it's really hard. It's not natural for us to understand things that are in 700 dimension. We need to reduce it down. This is why visualization is important. Here's also example of visualization, microbiome data. So um, again, if you want to work in this, um, the skills to uh, be able to visualize data, it's also a very important skills. Like there are a lot of tools, there are libraries to do that. Um, usually um, what are quite popular are Python and R, these two programming languages, because they have like a lot of good libraries for visualizations. Uh, but there are also other tools you can learn. Um, yeah, you have, uh, so if you see this, oh, this one is BCA plot. So, um, you have like two axes here, C1, C2, and you would see that uh, different data points, different uh, samples from different parts of your body. Actually, they, they cluster, they, they, 
they they um, form a different cluster depending on the location. Like for example, these are sample oral samples, and this one is nasal samples or skin samples. They cluster differently. So you see, this is just an example of how it's nice to have a nice visualization, so you can have a good um, um, conclusion, and you can understand your data better this way. Okay, and this is another example of visualization. You can see here one point is one OTU. They uh, decide to name their OTUs by numbers. So you have OTU 0018, you have OTU 0036, and all of these OTUs, um, whether they are species or genus or strains, they interact with each other, right? Oh, here, even you actually have the information. So the OTUs here that they colored with yellow color, they actually belong to Lactobacillus and um, orange belong to Clostridium 11 and so on. Okay, so you can, you can also visualize your data like this, um, or you can also take a more high level view. You just look at uh, your data by, you know, like the kingdoms that they, they, they belong. So for this one, like you have archaea, fungi, bacteria, it really depends on what you want to see and what you want to study, right? Um, so, okay. So next, uh, I just, I already gave you an overview of what um, people usually do for biophotic analysis. And you can also do AI for microbiome. Um, and this is actually very useful. And it's just like, there's like a growing, you know, like a, study, a growing number of studies of people doing this kind of uh, analysis. Why? Because let me give you an example. Okay, there is a case study. If you want to uh, check or if you want to predict if a person is lean or obese, yeah, if they are, if they have like a good weight, like um, normal weight or underweight, or if they are overweight, example okay um you can actually have 90 percent accuracy if you predict this by looking at the microbiome in their digestive tract okay 90 percent it's not bad yeah it's yeah quite decent um but uh, if you use the same type of classifier, the same type of machine learning algorithm that's called random forest, maybe you've heard of this, it's just a type of you know, machine learning algorithm. If you use uh, human genes to predict this, you would actually only get 57% accuracy. This is based on research by Professor Rob Knight, compared it to the gut microbiome. So yeah, you see why people get excited about microbiome because um, you know, it's very interesting, like how can we get like higher accuracy from these microbes than our own genes, right? So, so uh, it shows that uh, microbes actually, microbiomes, microbes and the interaction, they actually play a um, very important role in our life, right? Okay, this is also another example. So microbiome genomics for can cancer prediction. This is also a very hot area of research. Like a lot of people um, work on this because like you start to see um, that you can actually predict um, the incidence of cancer from someone's micro microbiome. Like even, um, you know, like sometime before it actually happened or um, I, Read rather another research, they found um, a link between, um, you know, the survivability of a patient after a certain surgery based on the microbiome in their body. Right? It's 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 pretty crazy if you think about it, and it's also exciting because again unlike the dna or your human genes that you pretty much cannot change um your microbiomes can be changed relatively easily right you can improve your diet for example you eat healthier um that's why maybe you've heard about re research that says okay people uh that live very long and healthy and 
happy life they um eat well and there's like certain diets that can help you to have a longer life like and better life like mediterranean diet for example there's like a lot of uh, research on that because yeah it actually have uh, a lot of uh, impact in your health right okay now i want to uh, uh, go through some challenges uh, in working with microbiome data uh, i think i need to speed up now uh, yeah the first one is the sheer amount of data okay this is just another example of what I just showed you. This is the fast Q format. Um, so you will deal with a lot of them, right? Why? Because you have you will have like millions of sequences and sometimes even tens of millions or hundreds of millions of sequences. And you have like files after files after files that just look like this, right? So um, that's why you need to use the right tools to analyze them also yeah you need you will need a lot of storage space so ideally you would have an infrastructure for that either high performance computers or you have a cloud like um, amazon um, aws no, ios or google i think it's called google uh who's that google cloud or azure uh, you, there's a lot of uh, providers right now, and you will use I don't know, a lot of things like, for example, you need a Python programming language, R, Weka, Perl, Perl is also a programming language, um, Hadoop, and a lot of other tools to help you. Okay, and also you need to be aware that um, the microbiome itself is very complex. Um, yeah, we can see the link between, you know, somebody's being sick, somebody is healthy, and we see the difference in their microbiome, but it's actually more complex than that, like one of the um, uh, thing that people debate these days, like, is this, um, is it the chicken or egg question, right? Um, are we sick because our microbiome is bad? Or is our microbiome bad because we are sick? I mean, which one comes first, right? Um, so even though you can clearly see the link, you know, like the cause and um, the actual, the precise mechanism, the pathways, um, we're still studying that, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't know yet, right? So um, yeah, this is why it's important to understand that. And also it's very complex because you don't just, uh, it's not enough to notice, okay, there is this, I don't know, Staphylococcus, there is bacterium, there is this, there is that, but also you need to study the interaction. What do they do? Their functions in the community and so on. Yeah, this is the same one I just told you. Okay, and in terms of data sets from the you know computer science point of view or mathematical point of view, um, the data sets are quite sparse, over this, dispersed, and zero inflated. So there's a lot of zeros in the data, and they have complex covariance uh, structure. So the direction of the relationship between two variables is quite complex. You know, like um, it's not enough that uh, you know A and B they have complex relationship between them, but the relationship between A and B can affect C. And then the relationship between A, B, C can affect D and so on. Like you have like a lot of uh, factors that you need to think about. And the, these factors are keep, uh, you know, they are living organisms, so they keep interacting, so they might change. And you need to also keep that in mind. Okay, this is just an example of uh, some interesting papers in the, in the field, you can also read that if you're interested. Um, and also remember that the data sets are compositional, compositional because we saw the example of the trees earlier and also the fruits, right? There's apples and they are like parts of the community. So the challenge here is that sometimes 
um, or often actually, you cannot use the standard statistics that you have learned that you are used to before. Like for example, in high school, you have you know student theta statistics or something else um, or ANOVA with microbiome because of this additional complexity, also uh, the data, the, the inherent nature of the data, you need different things like, I don't know, from ANOVA instead of ANOVA or you need to find, or you need to add, you know, like um, uh, Bonferroni correction on top of the p-value, because when you're doing analysis with the taxa, there's so many taxa, right? There's so many taxonomic units. So it's not enough to just do this, to get the simple p-value. You need a layer of correction on top of that to actually get the right result. Uh, this is just an example also. Uh, of a paper that talks about this and there's still a lot of debate in this it's it keeps evolving so yeah that's one of the challenges okay uh in nosantics we have like some principles and some principles that we try to live by so we need to remember that in machine learning or in data analysis in general this is true yeah this is always true garbage in garbage out if what you put there is not good, if the data is not clean, if the sequencing is not of high quality, then the result or the conclusion that you get will also not be good, okay? Because it depends on the data. That is the strength of the conclusion, the strength of the analysis depends on the strength of the data first and foremost, okay? So that's why a lot of people have said like, for example, uh, this researcher, the key to machine learning is prepping the right data. It's true. You cannot just like pull rubbish and like try to uh, uh, make it nice. You, you, you actually can't do that. And uh, thankfully, uh, we have uh, everything in house I and mean, we are familiar also uh, people in I3L. So uh, we can do our own sequencing and so on. We do our own like uh, collection and so we have a uh, control of our data quality and also uh, remember like I mentioned to you like our data have high dimensions so there is this thing called the curse of dimensionality especially in machine learning this is a concept in machine learning so um, if you have data that has high dimension it can actually uh, make you get a really bad result with machine learning, for example, the prediction um, power is gonna be low because there's so many dimensions. So you have to either reduce them or you just uh, pick the dimensions that are most relevant. But picking and choosing and reducing, they also need a, a certain skill sets, right? Uh, a certain knowledge, how to do the picking correctly. If you want to go to the market, you want to buy mangoes, mangoes, right? You need to know first, like, how does a good mango look like? If you don't know, if you've never eaten mangoes in your life before, how do you know which mangoes are good, right? Um, yeah, like sometimes, you know, like maybe, yeah, you, you, you will come across like some new fruits, like maybe, I don't know, like buah matoa. Has anyone heard of buah matoa? So I, 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 I came across buah matoa recently, apparently it's from Papua, very interesting, but because I've never eaten this fruit before, I don't know how to pick a good matoa fruit. I go to the market and I have like, okay, how do I choose a good matoa fruit? I've never eaten it before. I don't know how, should, how it should taste, right? So if you don't know like what to look for, it's also hard. So there is like another set of skills that you need here just to choose like what data I should use and what data you shouldn't use, right? Okay, and also uh, do not believe everything you read online, even if it, he's, even if it has been published in a scientific journal. Because, um, okay, this is a, a paper, again, like an example from, um, you know, like for example, this in psychology, um, only 39% of the experiments are successfully replicated. We actually, we have the same problems with microbiome studies, like a lot of people, a lot of researchers have talk about this, uh, the, the, the challenge of replicability in microbiome data uh, studies, but maybe that's also because um, it's still a young field and maybe like 
if you are from a different institution, the way you collect the data, the way you uh, sequence it, the way you analyze it is going to be very different from the other institution, right? Um, so that can introduce this, like uh, the, the issue of replicability. Um, so um, usually, like if I do something, I will always try to verify like what, what people have done uh, to see if this is applicable for our data. Because sometimes, you know, you will have different constraints in your data that other people don't have, or maybe they do have, but they don't mention it. That's also possible, right? And um, okay, so thank you so much for staying awake up to this point. Um, uh, I know that for some of you, this is your first power talk. So I hope this is a good experience for you and not a painful one. And this is a bonus meme for you. Um, this is a joke. So, you know, like when you do a task by hand, like by your own hand manually, you can technically say that you train a neural network to do it, but not in the way that many people will think right why because like your brain is actually a network a neural network i mean the neural network algorithm was inspired from your brain so if you do something manually even if you didn't train um the a computational neural network you can still technically say you train a neural network to do it okay yeah that's it uh thank you so much for having me you can reach out to me by email or uh, via linkedin and yeah, looking forward to your questions. Okay, um, this is from Ka Amalia. Okay, can I ask uh, Amalia, like what kinds of uh, results did you get? Um, is it like taxonomic classification or is it also of habitat diversity or like what, like what kind of results the third party generated? Oh, hi, Miss Pa. Hello. This is Amalia. So um, uh, the data that the third party generated is mm -hmm. was basically all of them that you mentioned before, including the alpha and beta diversity. It was my first time learning about them. And, you know, there are some um, uh, different like graphs, like the PCA plots mm -hmm. and I forgot LCF, LCF, e, L, 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 F, S, e. I oh, forgot. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. E, F, S, e, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were so various that uh, as the beginner, I didn't know where to look at first. And at that time, I struggled a lot to um, interpret the data, but it was still um, a valuable data, right? But uh, yeah, so what I would like to ask because my next project will be also working on a microbiome, this time for guts. Uh, I would like to know if you have a recommendation for references or reading materials or courses uh, for uh, beginners in interpreting the omics results like proteomics or maybe microbiomics uh, analysis like that, especially for those who are not um, really familiar with um, the statistical analysis and data analysis like you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your question. Um, yeah, so I agree, it's quite uh, specialized. Um, I think there are some good resources online. Um, you can look for professor uh, what's his name what's his name uh knight um on youtube he has some very good um like a series like series of videos uh, let me check what's his name uh to cry on his name uh yeah professor rob knight okay um okay i will send you this i think i found oops uh oh yeah dan knights that's his name oh sorry okay um i will send it to you here okay he has like series of uh lecture in microbiome discovery um about 21 videos 
um, it's quite a lot, but unfortunately, yeah, it does take time to understand. Um, just be patient there. And yeah, he has like one, okay, here, this is good. He has like a whole lecture on alpha diversity. So you can uh, check out uh, his explanation. From these three particular samples. We yeah. Uh, I'll send it to you also here and everyone else you can have a look this is alpha diversity but they also have he also has like beta diversity picking OTUs uh, visualization clustering and so on okay it's uh, um, it's quite useful um, for left C hmm. so I usually learn by you know, reading the paper um, or um, so usually something like LFC, right? They publish a paper and then other people will start using it and then they publish their own papers using that tool. So what you can do, you can go to LFC's paper and then uh, in Google Scholar, you will have like citation, right? Like, like cited by or something like that. And then you can click on that and you see a list of other people or other studies that use that um, that tool or that paper in their other studies. So what I usually did, like I would go there and then I will look at examples of how they use this tool. Um, so you will have a, you know, you will have some kind of um, understanding of how this tool is used, uh, what, is it for and like what kind of things are important in using the paper? Because people usually mention that. With LFC, I don't know if there is any good, you know, like beginner introduction to that. Uh, yeah, so maybe that's what you can do, I think, for now. And yeah, also uh, Chime 2 has uh, some good tutorials. Um, that you can also look at uh, because Chime uh, or Chime 2 is just like one of the tools, right? But they actually, uh, their tutorials are, I think the best compared to other things, you know, like you also have Mother, you also have DDI2 uh, that kind of does the same thing, but all that I think Chime has the best tutorials out of them. So, here, I also send you the links here is a tutorial and they give you examples of the files that you can download. So um, it's really nice, like here, uh, you have example of understanding alpha perfection, um, diversity analysis, alpha diversity, and don't forget the forum. The forum is very, very useful, Chime2 forum. Um, they're also very helpful. So if you don't um, if you don't understand certain things, yeah, even when it's interpretation of your result, you I, I have seen people post this like, oh, I have this, but I'm not sure how do I analyze it, um, because they have like a lot of people who are active there, they can sometimes like or often they can help you just go to the forum and ask for some clarification. Oh so, yeah, I guess that's all. Or you can you can uh, contact me and um, if I have time, like I can I can also try to help you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Paradia. That has been very helpful. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, uh, the second one, uh, Ms. Puspa, uh, is this? Uh, should I just answer this from Kawisnu? Kawisnu. Answer which question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you may answer, Ms. Farah. Please. Okay, thank you, Ms. Puspa. Okay, this one is from Kawisnu. Um, is there any database or knowledge base that has microbiome, microbiome data to practice on? Yeah, the Chime to one does. And actually, it is very well organized. Um, uh, here, I will send you the link again. Um, where is the tutorials? 
Okay, so not only they have the data, but it's separated by step, right? So the first one, you have this step, and this is the data that you need for this step. And then there's the next step, and there's the data, like very well organized, you know, because sometimes like there's a website that has a lot of data, but um, it's hard to see. So I would uh, really recommend this link, like the Chimpu tutorials, if you're looking for data to practice with. Yeah, definitely this one. Okay. We have next question from Arif regarding oh. the um, measurement of quantity and purity. Yeah, and make to make sure that our GDNA from environment is good enough to prevent from garbage data input. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, there are actually a lot of approaches uh, to optimize um, what you get from the sequencing. Right. Uh, of course, you need to measure the quantity. You can use, I don't know, qubit, right? And purity also, maybe like nanodrop, using nanodrop. Um, but in the process itself, you know, um, when you do the sequencing, like I'm not the expert in doing the next gen sequencing, but what we learn is that, okay, um, so because we have an expert uh, in our company, right? There is a Ka Ajeng who um, is also, who is actually an expert in next gen sequencing. So she has done like a lot of sequencing. Um, there are ways you can do like uh, data normalization and then you need to calculate um, uh, the input that you have to make sure like, like how much you put and then you uh, do some kind of normalization. I'm not expert in this, but <laughs> um, Ka Ajung knows uh, so much more than this. So yeah, there is a lot of approaches and you also uh, need to make sure that your machine is actually running uh, well. Um, if you run the machine by yourself, you will get like report for the machine, you know, uh, that will tell you if, um, the process is running well, or if there is, or maybe, um, you know, like there's some pipetting error when you put the data in. So that's also important, not just the quality of the, the DNA or the GDNA or the RNA or whatever, but also how you put it in the machine and how the machine is run. Because yeah, the machine, uh, like you can do everything well, but then it turns out that the, the machine, like for example, there is some like optical issues because like with Illumina, for example, the technology is like, they have like um, tiny cameras that capture, you know, like the, the, the reaction, right? In the DNA. So if you have one base like C, it will light up a certain way and then the cameras will capture that. And then there's a T and C and so on. So if there's a problem with the optics there, like you will also get, bad data so there's a lot of things involved there um you would need an expert like Ajung or um yeah you would need to learn like a lot of literatures on 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 that like how to run it from the beginning till you get the data there is a lot of processes there yeah okay, okay. we have one more question from Miss Maria, yeah. So this, uh, the question regarding how can we assure that our analysis is valid while uh, there are many factors might affect the microbiome pattern such as diet, environment, age, etc. That is true, and this is also like one of the challenges. Um, you're right. Um, uh, there are some ways where you can try to minimize uh, these impacts, right? The impacts of other factors because uh, you can call them like confounding factors, okay? And there are some statistical analysis uh, that you can do, right? Um, you can uh, try to exclude uh, or you can try to, how to say, declare these factors in your statistical analysis, 
to see um, if some of these effects is caused by those factors. Like for example, I'm just giving you a simple example, right? In uh, um, Permanova, for example, that's like what I mentioned to you, like there is this uh, test, uh, this analysis, you know, uh, that's called Permanova, Permutational Multivariate Analysis of Variance uh, to check, uh, to compare uh, groups of objects, right? Um, and you can declare, for example, like your um, other factors there, like diet, environment, age, and you can see the results, you know, like if um, uh, what's statistic statistically significant there is from diet instead of the uh, microbiome data that you have, then probably that's, um, you need to study that further or you need to exclude that from the data, right? And there are also ways to exclude that from the data. Um, like, for example, we can use, uh, there are some tools that you can do to kind of reduce these effects uh, from your data. So it will go through your data. And if you declare these variables, diet, environment, uh, age, ethnicity, uh, it can kind of, you know, uh, remove that effects from the data. Um, I will find some papers and I will send do you. Can you send me uh, some, can you send me a message to my LinkedIn? Because I don't remember on top of my head, but uh, I will find the papers uh, and send them to you. But that's true, that's important. Uh, that's in terms of bioinformatics analysis, right? But also I think a good project, a good research project should start with the design. So it's not enough usually to just, you know, correct this while you have the data, but it should actually start from the design. So in the design, ideally what you should do is you should make sure that all of these factors are accounted for. Like for example, okay, diet. If you know that diet will be a very important factor, then ideally what you should do is you should um, control for it. You see, it's like, for example, okay, maybe you just choose uh, samples in cohorts. And then like in uh, one cohort, like you have uh, samples uh, that have the same diet. And then you compare differences in the samples that are doing the same diet. Um, the, um, for example, age. Age, do you see the, the difference there between the age, right? So you need to design the experiment in a way that you can control for these factors if you think that these factors will be important. So it starts from the... that can help you correct the data, but it's usually, it's always better if in the design you already take that into account rather than like doing it in the, uh, in the uh, latest stage of your analysis. And at that time, like, again, like garbage in, garbage out, I'm afraid, I mean, if you don't have like a good design, if you don't know like which people have which diet, which people have which ethnicity, it's gonna be very hard to analyze it because you have all of these confounding factors mixed up and like affecting your data. Okay. Okay, Ms. Mara, uh, I have one question from me. Okay. Uh, yeah, so regarding the research project, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, currently from Nosantix, uh, what are the available research projects and whether it is uh, possible for our students in I3L to be part of these research projects. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have um, for microbiome, for the commercial service, as I mentioned, we have a uh, skin right now, the skin biome um, that I mentioned in the talk. Uh, we have also internal projects, like usually, you know, like some pilot projects, like in the past, we had some collaboration with, for example, 
um, a resort in Bali uh, to study, you know, like microbiome of the soil, microbiome of the, not the soil, sorry, microbiome of the air. So you can uh, compare microbiome from, you know, different locations with different levels of pollution, different levels of human activity and so on. So that's an example. Um, uh, for internship, uh, I think usually if you reach out to us, um, uh, we will try to match you uh, with the projects that are available at that moment because sometimes like the projects will change. Sometimes, uh, okay, this project is finished and then you have new project. Um, so it really depends on the, the project at that time. Also the candidate, um, if they have the uh, skill sets that are suitable, and again, I can um, try to connect you with the HR so uh, they can, you know, like see, okay, the CV, maybe it will fit well to the project. And of course there will be a selection, but yeah, feel free to reach out. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Farah. Thank you so much yeah. for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. It's our pleasure to have you as our speaker. So next, uh, uh, I would like the attendees to fill in the evaluation survey. Yeah, uh, so there is the QR code here, or you can uh, just go to the link below for uh, the evaluation survey form, yeah. So kindly fill the evaluation survey for this Power Talk program before you leave this event. Okay, many thanks for all the attendees who has already participated, asking questions as well as listening to the Power Talk until uh, the end of this event. Uh, I would like to uh, to share one one more information. So regarding the bioinformatics program from I3L, so there is a, an available scholarship opportunity. Yeah, I will share for uh, the information. So currently, a uh, bioinformatics study program is receiving for application for full, full scholarship, yeah. This is for bachelor degrees, a full scholarship starting from this term, yes, this term. And then uh, the application yeah, will be, so this uh, revised until end of this week. Yeah, so we will still receiving applicants until end of this week. And uh, please contact the number here, yeah. Uh, WhatsApp number and uh, you may also email yeah admission at i 3 So this is uh, dedicated for students who already graduated from high school, interested in computer and life science, and then you will receive invitation to to do the entrance test. And the requirement uh, will be a mandatory employment. Yeah, this is after you graduate the scholarship recipient will have an employment contract with I3L. Okay, so that's all for me. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Ms. Puspa. I really hope that uh, if you have attended this Power Talk until we finish, uh, you can uh, also fill in the evaluation survey program uh, that you can access with this link or QR code because this can help us improving uh, in a better uh, power talk in the future. So uh, if you have uh, any more questions, uh, you can uh, reach Ms. Farah again through her LinkedIn. And uh, thank you so much again for bearing with us for almost two hours. I see you until the next power talk. And uh, goodbye. Thanks, Ms. Safina. And sorry, it took a bit longer. <laughs> That's okay. We actually enjoy that so much. Aww, it's very interesting. Thank you. thank you so much. Hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.